Well, welcome everyone. Today's June 14th, 2015. My name is Carl Connor. Welcome to the Stepping Stones Project. Hey, we're still studying 2 Thessalonians, reading about the church, and uh, got some interesting parts today dealing with the end times. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Paul blends some pieces uh, in what's going to happen at the end of this age into all this stuff, and uh, sort of interesting in that regard. So let's go ahead and jump in. Used this map last week to talk about what, where we're at. We're in uh, this northern piece of the Greece, up in Thessalonica is where the letter is going to. And uh, Paul was down the southern part down there. You might be able to make out the little town of Corinth. Uh, it's actually a city. Um, and that's uh, where he's writing the letter from. And uh, this is writing back to that church in, in Thessalonica. The people there are the Thessalonians. This is his second letter to them. And he's telling them some stuff that they need to know. And he writes to them, but he writes to us as well. So let's see what he has to say. So we're jumping back into our text. We're in chapter two, and he's talking about a variety of topics. And I'll just jump right into what he's, he's discussing, what's going to happen um, at Judgment Day, at the end time. Now, we study Revelations, and so we got some of this stuff out there already, but I think it's important because this, this reinforces it very well for us. Uh, so starting at verse one, now concerning the coming of our Lord, Je Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. Okay, so being gathered to him. What, what term do we use for being gathered up in the clouds and going through there? Put your hands over on the keyboard and tell me, what do we, what do we call that? If we're one day, we're, we're all drawn together and gathered together to him, right? And Paul says, the rapture. Yeah, that's a great word. I'm sure you all use that every day on the bus on your way to work. Hey, guys, you talked about the rapture lately? Probably not so much. Um, right, so the rapture is, uh, is this concept of us being pulled together. And um, we will be uh, meeting him in the clouds we had read in the last few weeks. Uh, and so this is the, the end times and what will happen. How does how's it all end? And so now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, this is to everybody, this is a general one, not to be quickly taken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to come from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So what the heck is all this? All right, so we mentioned to you previously that the, the, one of the major reasons why Paul is probably writing this letter to the Thessalonians so quickly after the first letter is that they are undergoing persecution. And apparently there are folks who are explaining that this persecution is the end times. It's the persecution that will come at the end. See, we're now in the last days. And just FYI, somebody's got a microphone open, no problem, but just so you know, you're, you get some noise there. Um, so just so you're aware that, uh, you know, the, what will happen is that um, some people have said at that time period, look, the day of the Lord is already upon us. We are now in the end times. Okay, well, now, as a quick comment, I've, I've preached before that the end times have started. They started 2,000 years ago, and they're going to go into the future. Okay, so it's not like, uh, you know, like, oh, my gosh, it's like, poof, there it is. It's the end of time. But at the same time, what they were saying was that clearly this has already happened, and various folks had already said somewhat authoritatively, no, see, this is definitively it. Now, i got to be honest, guys. During your Christian walk, this is going to happen to you, or somebody's going to explain to you with no unquestioned why it is they have figured it out that the end times are near. In fact, I personally haven't recommended that I make certain decisions in my life. Um, well, the example I often give, perhaps too often, is, is I was advised not to bother going to seminary um, about 12 years ago when I was first talking about it because there was no way I could finish a three or four year seminary degree before Jesus would come. Well, okay, it's been 12 years now, and guess what? I'm I hope to graduate in December, and here you go. So my point of that is, is that anybody who tells you they've got it all figured out probably doesn't. No offense. And that includes me, just FYI, because I know I don't have it all figured out. So what, what do we know? Well, let's go through and see what do we know for sure. Well, verse three, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, that's the day of the Lord, his second coming, unless the rebellion comes first. Okay, what's the rebellion? Well, the word here in Greek um, has to do, it's called apostia, aposti, um, basically um, is becoming, uh, falling away from faith. And so this is a concept we see in a couple places that in the latter days, many will, will re forsake their faith. They'll walk away from their faith. They will, they will move away from the church and so forth. And we certainly are seeing in the United States of America, at least, that the regular, what we would call institutional church is not very popular. 
And a lot of people have pointed to England as an example of this, that England lost the church in one generation, that basically church attendance crashed uh, and, and fell off very, very rapidly in England. And this is one of the reasons why I personally wanted to go over to England, and I did back in 2008, because I wanted to see this with my own eyes and talk to people on the street corners. And I got to just tell you personally, and some of you heard me say this before, what I found was that while people were not attending church in a traditional manner, they were very open to spiritual conversations, and there very much was a spirit of Jesus Christ alive that I found. I had no problem sitting on a street corner in downtown Oxford, England at 11 o'clock at night and finding, striking up conversations, no joke, with passerbys while I was sitting on the, the front steps of the University of Oxford and being able, one of the colleges there, and being able to sit there and talk to people and, and, and openly talk about Jesus Christ and have good spiritual conversations with them. So the reason I share that with you is because England is often seen as a precursor of what's going to happen in the United States. And I don't know if it will or if it's not, but I don't see that personally as like the end times, everything's coming. Like this is the rebellion because look, see, it's already hit England. Because I've been told that just so you're aware of it. And, and you might hear that as well. And I just kind of mentioned that to you. I don't personally see it that way. But there will come a time, in all honesty, when there will be, will be a huge falling away from the church and people will, will walk out the door, and, and that is important to be aware of, and, and, and so that's something to think about. So unless the rebellion comes first, and then what comes next? The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Do I have any good King James folks here who know the good term for the son of destruction? If you can spell it, what's the, what's the name? Touch the P, son of, well, it's the Antichrist, you're absolutely correct. That was what I was looking at. Son of perdition. There you go. It's just a great word. And what it was kind of like rapture, one of those ones you probably don't use regularly. A son of perdition. Yep, Dion knew that one. I figured he would. I was fishing to see if he knew that one. There you go. Yes, the son of perdition, son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So you can read about this in Revelation. You can read about it other places in Paul. But the important part here is there is a human, an actual human, who will rise to power. He will come and he will sit, they say, in the temple of God. That probably means Jerusalem. Now, I believe, just so you're all aware of it, that the Christian church will be raptured up in what I call a pre-trib. That's a pretty pre-tribulation. So before the tribulation come, rapture will happen. So if you're ever in a spot where you see some huge world leader pull all the nations together underneath him in peace, and makes his capital in Jerusalem, one of a couple things has happened. Either I was wrong, and there wasn't a pre-trib rapture, or uh, next would be, um, sorry, you weren't saved. And if all your friends are missing at the same time, then you would go, okay, that's bad, right? So forth. Or in fact, he's not the Antichrist. Okay, just, just saying, couple possibilities. But that is the event that we would look for here, and I would look for it happen to, in the modern-day city of Jerusalem uh, is where uh, the unification would probably happen. And, and there's a really good reason for that is that there's three major religions, Jewish, Christianity, Muslims, who all treat Jerusalem as a, as a major, not the major, but as a major center of their faith. And so if somebody's going to pull off a unification for those three and pull it together, that's the spot he's going to do it in. Okay, so, you know, I, I think to that extent, it is worthwhile to watch what happens in Israel and the pieces there. But to be candid, I don't plan to be around for, for where, when this would happen. At least I don't think so as I read my Bible. Moving on. So verse five, do you not remember when I was still with you? I told you these things that you know what is restraining him from now on so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So even back at Paul's time, the spirit of lawlessness was happening then and it certainly happens now. So what kind of lawlessness do we have amongst us? Well, there's all kinds of things that go forth into our society. And in some ways, they're really no different than they were in Paul's time. We have the same temptations for things like sexual temptations, various types of money temptations, and of course, all the things related to, to various types of things that we can abuse. Okay, granted, we've got new types of drugs we didn't have back then. I'll give you that one. But the major drug, alcohol, was around at that time, and it can certainly be abused. So from that perspective, these areas of lawlessness have really been around for a long time. And even though there's a quick comment when we talk about it, Jesus Christ, um, you know, when we say that he on the cross took on every one of our sins, he knew all the, the, the pain that comes with, with sexual addiction. He knows all the pains that came from things related to financial things. He understood alcoholism and he understood drug addiction, even though those drugs hadn't been evolved, you know, invented yet, hadn't come around yet. He understood that what that was there. And when he died on the cross, he 
died understanding what it was like to be tempted by all of those things. And I just kind of offer that up to you as something to think about that he is fully able and capable of taking all of those sins on because he understands each and every one of them. So at the tail end of verse seven, only he, that's Jesus, who now restrains it, will do so until he's out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So for more details, read Revelation, and you can read all about this. This is where we see the Lord Jesus coming with a, with a figurative sword coming out of his mouth. And the thing is, it's his breath, it's his word, the power of his speech. When he speaks a word of power, that he will be able to come against the, the, uh, the powers of evil that are there. In verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power of false signs and wonders. It'd be pretty impressive when this person, the, and, and all your names you've mentioned here are correct, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the, the, the son of destruction, all these ideas. Um, these are all the correct names here. And he, yes, he will come with false signs and wonders and will be amazing uh, and will, will unfortunately dissuade many people. And so with all de wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So this is hard. Um, this next piece, as you look at it, wonder, well, you know, why does God allow people to, to be deceived? Why, why doesn't God force himself upon the world and say, you will believe in me, I will give you no choice, but I will just show up on Times Square with lightning and, and there I am, and you will have no choice but to leave in me because I have forced myself upon your brain. And Ginger, wow, it's Ginger. Ginger's first on the keyboard with the answer. You're right, free will. You're right, Ginger. And there you go. All right, so yes, um, you learned something somewhere along the line. Yes, free will. And the answer is, is that, uh, believe it or not, God respects you too much to force himself upon you in such a way that you are forced to, to accept that he is there. And, and, and that's difficult for me. I have to be honest because the consequence of that free will is that people have the ability the right, if you will, to accept and believe that which is totally false. And a consequence for that is that because they have made that choice and said, God, I wish to follow a lie, let me follow it, you get verse 11. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that may they, so they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And let me be clear, God wants everyone to be saved. But if God looks at you and says, would you please accept the truth, and you say no, then he will do, believe it or not, what is, in, what is there to allow you. He will say, okay, fine, then this, this is what your world looks like to you. And that's what this, you know, the, the Greek here is there. <laughs> Paul says, I, you beat me because I type with a two-finger system. That is so funny. All right. So, but, so that's, a, that's a heavy statement. And, and, you know, and, and Amy, I think you could probably go back to, to Pharaoh here and God hardening Pharaoh's heart. I think this is a close related thing that somebody who chooses to go down a wrong path, God says, OK, then I will then say this is what the consequences of your choice are. And this is the piece that's there. But that's hard. I mean, we, we all, you know, and, and you kind of think as a parent, have you ever um, and I'm sorry to say this, but have you ever had a child who just desperately wanted to go down a particular pathway and you said, OK. And you're going to let it run out until the person sees that that pathway is bad, hoping it's for the greater good. Has anybody here as a parent ever, ever done that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I have. Absolutely. You know, uh, uh, yep. <laughs> well, this is kind of what God's doing in this case. And the only hope that I have, or that I hope that there is that the person is, is on a pathway then that they say, I choose destruction. And God says, okay is that they will reach a point where their physical destruction runs out before their spiritual destruction kicks in. And by that, I mean that their body gives out, their finances give out, their time gives out, their friends give out before God gives out. And by that, what I mean is, is that they reach a point where they finally strike, as they would say in Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, that you strike bottom, that you realize that you are, to quote Bill W., sick and tired of being sick and tired. And when you reach that point, you are finally at the spot where, no offense, there is nowhere to go but up because you have struck bottom and you can only reach. And if you look at the bottom of a deep hole, you can still see the light. 
And the amazing part, because I know I did this when I cursed God, fought against God, argued against God, did everything I could to fight against Christianity, and ran as far away from him as I possibly could. Every step I took away from him, he was right there behind me. And I really did imagine when it was time for me that I felt I realized I'd hit my bottom in the sense, and I was going to come back, that I was going to have to do this long walk back. And I took one step, turned around, and I fought him, God, right behind me. And he was there the whole time. If I had just taken and done a 180, which, by the way, we talk about repentance. Repentance is turning away from your sins and turning to God. It's that whole idea of a 180-degree turn of stopping to do it your way and turning to look at Jesus and say, I can't do it. Somebody else can. I think I'll let him. So with that, as you think about then what you know, goes happening here in verse 11 is that God is saying, if you flat refuse to accept the truth, I will let you do that. And to the extent that it hopefully drives someone closer to him, well, then I hope that they go there before time runs out. Verse 13, but, contrast, but, we ought always to give thanks to God for you. Why for you? Because the people he's writing the letter to are ones who have chosen to reject the lie and to accept the truth. And so we who are in Christ should accept, then give thanks for those who in fact have been saved and have chosen to make a decision to turn to the light. But we always ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Through sanctification, that means making holy, by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this, he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he used the story of the gospel, just as I'm trying to use the story of the gospel today, to call out to you, just as I'm trying to call out today to anyone who's listening here today or may listen to this video on YouTube later, to be able to say, if you stop, turn and turn to Christ, you have an opportunity to have a new life. So then, brothers and sisters, I say that because it's a generic one. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope, through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And here ends the reading. I've got a couple takeaways for you. Please grab something to write on, and let me just reiterate a couple of the points that I've already made. Takeaway number one, be like the Bereans and dig deep to question everything you hear. Test it against the Bible and with other Christians that you trust. He says not to be shaken, quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or even a letter seeming to come from us. Apparently, there was probably a forged letter that claimed to be from Paul that was not. And there were people who claimed to have seen a spirit and they able to go and they were saying, this is here, this has happened. And Paul says, in fact, there's another spot, of course, where he says that, you know, if another, even some another gospel comes to you, even from an angel or seems to be from an angel, if it contradicts what you have heard here and is in the Bible, reject it. So be like the Bereans. The, the people with Bereans were, were more noble because they dug out and looked and tried to say there. Now, I think the important part here to understand is that there is indeed a opportunity here to have a reasoning part to your faith. I'm not asking for a blind faith, and I don't think God is either. He is asking for you to take and reason. In fact, he even says those words, come, let us reason together. Okay? The important part to understand is that you, if you rely on your own reasoning and your own understanding, you will fall short. But if you're willing to accept God's, there's hope. Additionally, I would encourage you to rely on those around you, other Christians, said it before, one of the key things I feel that I have learned during seminary is that Christianity is meant to be done in community. If you go into your own little shell and you take one little Bible verse and you run with it to the extreme, you will go to heresy, I promise you. If you take this one verse and put it above everything else in the Bible and you make this your cornerstone, everything there, I don't care which verse you pick, but you just pick any verse out of context and run with it and push it to the extreme in any direction, you will eventually cross the line and go into heresy. You get into what we call stinking thinking, and you're by yourself over there. So even that sounds like a great idea. It's from the Bible, but I would encourage you to work with the Christian community. Work with the church 
to talk through and reason through and rely not upon your own understanding. And I do the same thing, guys, just so you're aware of it. When I get a hard theological problem, I don't try I just you know, figure it out myself. I talk to others of you here in the church, and I talk to other pastors that I'm friends with to be able to go through and sound off from there. And then I spend a lot of time in prayer to listen to what God has to say to me about that particular hard nut I'm trying to crack. So <clears throat> that's point number one. Number two, the ordained events that will transpire. There are ordained events that will transpire before the Son of Man will return. Until then, don't worry about it. You can't change it anyway. Don't sweat the end of time like it's something like, oh my gosh, in that sense, okay? The, you know, and I say this particularly if you're, if you're a Christian. Now, I will confess, if you're not a Christian, you might want to sweat it, okay? If you're, if you're listening to my voice today and you're, you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, okay, you, you, you do in fact have reason to be concerned because he will come, as they say, like a thief in the night. And it will not be expected, and it will suddenly just pow, and all of a sudden, there it is. So I, I would suggest in that case, you, you do have something to fear. But if you're listening to my voice today, and you've decided to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if there's a date and a time that you can point to, at this day, on this moment, I know I became a Christian because I prayed a salvation prayer, which is what you need to do. And I have followed up since then, and I'm confident that I've been saved. Don't worry about it. It's, it's not your problem that when, when it's going to come. A lot of people really chase what I would call, they, they go down what's called a rabbit hole here, that they, they, they spend, I'm not joking, I've, there are whole folks, Sheree, can I use your family as an example? So Sheree has some, some relatives in her family that the children in that generation didn't ever go to college because it was no point, because the end time was coming. And that's been, what, 15, 20 years ago now? guess what? They're all adults now. And <laughs> so, you know, don't be so heavenly conscious that you're no earthly good. Okay, please. That's, this is not helpful. So um, until then, don't worry about it. You can't change it anyway. So the verse, of course, I quoted from before was from that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. So he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Okay? <clears throat> so uh, Amy mentions, of course, that we're often told to, to live in a state of readiness. I totally would agree with that. So, we, you know, Trey and I call it, you know, living caught up. Um, you know, do what you can, get your affairs in order, and then quit worrying about it. Live in a state of readiness. Be ready, in, as Peter would say, both in season and out of season. And by that, he means be ready when you think it's coming and when you think it's not. Okay? This is, I think, some of the important parts here to, to be aware of, okay? Number three, and I said this before, but I thought it, bared, it was bared repeating, it, it would bear repeating at this point. Number three, you have to know where you stand before you take a stand. I'll say it again. You have to know where you stand before you take a stand. And by this, I mean that you need to Dig deep into your Bible, like, like the Brians, and you need to think through. There are times when I'll present an idea, guys, very intentionally, and I will say, on this particular point, I think the answer is A, and biblically, this is why I think. And then some of you have been surprised that I then say, but I could be wrong, and the answer might be B. And if so, I would recommend you use these biblical verses to back you up. But this is not a salvation point. This is not like you have to, you know, like go buy yogurt and do these things and blueberries to get saved versus somebody else says it's Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I'm joking. But if you follow my point, it's not, it's not, like, like, not like one Bible verse says Jesus was the son of God and, uh, you know, you have to trust in him. And a different verse says, oh, no, it's not him at all. That's simply not the case. We don't have that. But there are points where we go through and we discuss that, that, that either it's probably A or B. And what you're going to hear me always do is, encourage you to be able to back up your point from the Bible in a thoughtful and well thought, you know, well thought out way, carefully work your way through it. And the reason why is because when you take a stand, someone will question why you believe it's there and they will do everything that they can to try and prove one point of your argument wrong to throw everything else away, which I find fascinating that they will just, if they can get anything, if they can get any angle on you, any chink in your armor, it's, you know, well, you were wrong on this particular point once, once, therefore everything you're saying now is wrong. Okay, I'm not perfect, but I do know the Bible says this. Yes, but this other person who says something similar to that, he's a televangelist and he stole millions of dollars. Yes, that's correct. 
Well, therefore, what you're saying is wrong. No, I still think what the Bible says is wrong. That person just did wrong after quoting the Bible. Again, the Bible says the following. And if you continue going to the Bible as your rock and your foundation, you will do well. Does every track along with that? So you need to know where you stand before you take a stand. And so Paul expresses that here. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. There are lots of places to take a stand. And that actually is what the question of the week relates to. Where do I need to take a stand this week? Sometimes it's on a moral issue. It's something going on. And the question is, is that do you take a stand and say something about it or do you not? Well, pray about it, but there are times when you need to take a stand. Some will say, thou shalt not judge. Okay, what exactly does that verse say? The verse says to take the log out of your own eye before you attempt to take the splinter out of the other person's. It doesn't say you never try to take the splinter out of the other person's eye. Yes, I would agree. It starts with self-examination, doing the best you can. But from that perspective, there is a spot where if you have someone who is near and dear to you and they are destroying their life by something that's there, you are remiss to not say something or at least try to. From that perspective, I think it's important to be able to think about where it is God wants you to take a stand and to know your Bible and know your Holy Spirit within you and be able to rely upon those two so that then you can speak the word of truth in love. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for all who joined us here today. And I just ask for each and every one of them, you lay your hand upon them and draw them closer to you. I thank you for all that you are doing and bless you, ask, just bless us as we are continuing to walk the path that you have laid before us. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.